you never know when it's actually over or if they just faked it, you know, faked the ending to trick me. And that, that does happen sometimes. So, uh, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, he doesn't know I'm talking to him. <laughs> Um, all right, so I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, welcome. Uh, just real quickly before we get started, I do want to say uh, I want to if you're if you're visiting, if this is your first time here, uh, if you're just passing through, we do want to say welcome. If and uh, if if you want to, there is a visitor card in the seat back in front of you. If you want to, go ahead and fill that out. And on your way out, uh, at the welcome desk in the lobby, you can drop that off and get a free gift. We will not bother you. You won't regret giving us your information. We just want to be able to say hi and thanks for coming. Um, if you'd rather remain anonymous, that's obviously okay too. I probably wasn't supposed to say that part, but um, but we uh, yeah we we would love to say thanks for coming and, and welcome if, uh, if that's something you'd like to do. So that's in the seat back in front of you on the visitor card. Um, I will also say I have um, I'm just getting over bronchitis, and if if this had been just a couple of days ago, I would have all but it had all but no voice at all so that we are here and it's the second service and we're still going is kind of amazing to me uh so thanks so much for being here and if, if i have to cut this short because i just am no longer able to speak sorry i'll email you what the sermon was supposed to, to say i guess um, all right, so anyway, all that to say, let's go ahead and get started. So Ashley started this series a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we're talking about spring cleaning. We're talking about this idea of kind of reconnecting all the different parts of ourselves and, and, and kind of fine-tuning what it means to be people, people who live as fully integrated, like, spiritual beings in the world. And so uh, today we're going to be talking about the, like, the physicality and, and the idea that, that your physical self is connected to your spiritual self. And I'll just go ahead and say... Right off the bat, I was an indoor kid. I continue to be an indoor kid. And outdoors, out, outdoors was never my thing. And, and the thing is, I, I grew up in a very small town near here called Hinton. And, uh, and I had lots of friends who were very outdoorsy. Like you, you, when you live in a small town like that, you kind of have to be a little bit. And, and so I had friends who lived like way out in the country. And when I say the country, like if you've ever been driving through rural Oklahoma and been passing nothing for miles and all of a sudden there's a house and, you're, and you point at it and you're like, who in the world would live in that house? My friends are who lived in that house. And so I would sometimes, so like being an indoor kid, I would have to pretend to be an outdoor kid in order to, you know, like have friends. And so like I would, I remember one time I was, I was like 11 or 12 and I was over at my friend's house, like way out in the country. And he was one of these kids who just loved to go outside and just like go walk around and like see what we could find. And so one time we were, we were out in the middle of like this area out near his house. And there was a, there was like a cow pasture that he wanted to, to go through. And, um, and there was an electric fence. And, um, and so he, he was showing me, like, I do this all the time. Like, you just get down, you, like, army crawl under the electric fence. Just make sure not to touch it, you know, because it's called an electric fence for a reason. I was like, got it, context clues. Don't touch the electric fence. And so, um, and so he showed me how to do it. looked super easy. And I was like, I don't want to do any of this, but I'm here. And it's not like I can call an Uber and get me to, <laughs> to like, a ride home. So I guess, I guess we're doing this. So I, I army crawl underneath the electric fence, and I almost made it. And um, as I'm standing up, my elbow just, like, very gently grazed the electric fence, and it felt like I'd been stung by a dozen bees. It was, it was so painful. And I yelped, and he was like, I told you not to touch the electric fence. I was like, right, sorry, forgot. So... Um, so anyway, at, at, at that point, I was like, maybe we can be like in-town friends. Maybe we can be like school and church friends and not necessarily like electric fence friends. Um, so all that to say, like outdoors has just, it, it's, I've, never, I've never been the kind of person who just loves to go outdoors. I'm, I'm friends with many of you on like social media. And some of you love to go like hiking and camping. And that, that is great. Don't ask me to go. I'm not doing it. And if, if you do invite me, I'm going to act all disappointed that I can't go because I'm busy, but I, I don't want to go. And so I'll just, I'll just tell you right now. I'm, I'll tell you, like, oh, I'd really love to, but I, I wouldn't. This, that, that is, that, that's a hard no for me. So you would think that we are, since we're talking about this, you would think they would have asked somebody to do this subject who, like, likes doing those kinds of things. And, like, I could do a whole sermon about, like, the outdoors is how you connect to God. And like, th this is like, nah, we've developed like plumbing and stuff and it's good. So I, um, but I do, I will say I do have a physical body and I do live in this world. And so there, there is, so I do, I have sort of reconciled, like, yeah, my, my own personal preferences aside, I do recognize that there is, there is a certain physicality to our spirituality. And that's what we're talking about. So like, sorry, I'm not going to give you the whole, like, go to the gym and go outside more sermon. Like if you were hoping for that, like, I'm sure 
Um, I'm sure Craig Rochelle has a bunch of them. You can find them on the, <laughs> on the internet. But um, that, um, we're, we're not going to go that, get that direction today. So, I, um, But I will say, though, a lot of us probably have been raised with this very dualistic way of seeing the world, right? Like, and what I mean by that is we've been taught that there are these two sides of ourselves. There is the spiritual side, which is the good side, and then there's the physical side, which often is referred to or sort of talked about sort of in a pejorative negative sense. Like that's, that's sort of the, 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 the language we tend to use about this is like it's, it's worldly or it's fleshly or things like that. And like the, almost like negative kinds of churchy words to sort of denote that there's a good part of us and a bad part of us. And the good part of us is the spiritual part and the bad part of us is the physical part. And so being, I was, I was a big church kid growing up and that was a great way to hide my utter disdain for the outdoors because I was, I, was, I could be like, no, I'm spiritual. I'd rather, uh, I'd rather sit inside and, and read because that's, I, it's a spiritual thing. It's not because I'm afraid of snakes and electric fences. So, um, so for lots of us, though, we've been handed this very, again, this very divided way of seeing reality. There's the f- physical versus the spiritual. And I wonder if that has actually caused us to split all of the physical aspects of life, like including our relationship with our own bodies, away from our understanding of spirituality. Well, you know, we have the spiritual self, but then also, you know, like you have to like live in this world for a little while. So you gotta, you gotta tend to your bag of flesh as best you can. And so, so there, is, there is a spiritual dimension though, I would argue, to how you relate to your body and to your surroundings that we probably don't talk about enough. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna dig into how do the scriptures talk about these kinds of things? And is it possible that in this like dualistic divided kind of language, we've lost a very, a deeply essential way of interacting with our spiritual selves that is connected and deeply entangled with our physical selves. So we're gonna go all the way back to Genesis chapter two. So Genesis one and two, this is what we often refer to as the creation stories. And so we have these these stories in Genesis one and two where what we have is we have this creator who's establishing like the creation of all things and all things are being sort of set as they were originally intended to be. So in Genesis two, beginning in verse five, it says this, it says, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the earth. And in verse seven says, then the Lord God formed a man or more, uh, more, correctly, humanity, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man, or humanity, became a living being. And so this, interest, this is the only time we're told that there's, there are specific ingredients that go into what gets made. And the, the ingredients are dust and breath. The hum, human beings are made with the dust of the ground and the breath of life. There are these two distinct elements that go into cr- the creation of humanity. So there's some Hebrew words. I know some of you were like, I really hope we learned some Hebrew today. So there's some Hebrew words that are very helpful in understanding what's going on here. So later on, we are told that the man's name is Adam. This is not a random arbitrary name. It's not like the creator was like, okay, we're gonna name everybody, but we're gonna go alphabetically just to keep it organized. And we're gonna start with Adam. No, Adam, it's actually a play on words. So the word Adam, in Hebrew, it was the word ha-adam. Now, this is connected to the word for ground, which is ha-adama. So Adam, Adam, has been formed from Adama. So in, in Hebrew, this sounds, it has sort of a rhythm to it. So Adam was created from Adama. Even the name Adam implies that there is a physicality to humanity. So Adama is one of the core ingredients to the creation of humanity. But also we're told, so also by the way, Adama could mean land or earth. So there's again, a physicality sort of built into it. But we're also told that humanity is made with the breath of life. In other word, breath here in Hebrew is the word nishmat. Now, nishmat literally means spirit. So the creation of humanity, the only thing that is described in this way in all of creation is humanity, is created with dust and spirit, with adama and nishmat. Both go into the creation of humanity. Both are essential. And when the human is named, he is not named for nishmat, he is named for adama. There is a physicality to the very essence of who this person is. Adama has created Adam. So in Genesis 2, human beings are created with both adama and nishmat, dust and spirit. So we have these very two 
very distinct, different elements um, that have very di- that are very different in nature that have gone into the creation of humanity, and they are both part of what is being created. So from the very beginning, we have this language that indicates when humanity exists. Anytime there is humanity, there is both dust and there is spirit. There is Adama and there is Nishmat. Both are present in every human being. So we often, again, we often have this very divided language of the self. We have, this, we have the spiritual self, and we have the physical self. Like, and again, we tend to divide these things in good versus bad. In the physical self, we use lots of language about like the flesh or the world or things like this that sound very negative and very dark. And, and so in Hebrew, what's interesting, though, is there is no word for spiritual there is a word for spirit, but there's no word for spiritual. So if you were to go to somebody who existed in this ancient Hebrew society, and you were to say, hey, can you explain to me how, like, can you talk to me about your spiritual life? They would say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because in the Hebrew mind, there is no division between the physical world and the spiritual world. In the Hebrew mind, all things are spir- spiritual. All physicality is inherently spiritual. All Adama is connected to Nishmat. There is no division between physical and spiritual because in the Hebrew mind, all of it is spiritual. You don't need a word for spiritual because the implication is like, well, what isn't spiritual? How can can anything that exists in this world be non-spiritual? So again, in in the Hebrew mind, there there is no division to this. There is no dualism in how we think about physicality and spirituality because there is no such thing as only spirituality. Everything in your physical life is spiritual. There is, there, there is this original entanglement between your skin and your spirit, your Adama and your Nishmat. And so the idea here is, the, from, the, from the very beginning, the idea here is you are an integrated being. And so to treat yourself as if one part of you is good and the other part of you is inherently bad leads to disintegration. Are you with me? So any sort of language that talks about spirit as good and, phys- and body as bad is a, dis- is a way to disintegrate what was originally meant to be integrated. So if you've ever been to, say, a church event, and they started talking about how like evil your body is and how you need to be a lot, you, 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 there, there's a certain amount of shame that's just sort of built into how we see our physical selves. What is that? Oh, that's, that's somebody trying to disentangle body and spirit. That's somebody who's trying to disconnect Nishmat from Adama. And in the original story, it's like, no, 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 these two things are entangled. These are integrated things. And so when you try to disintegrate these things, something begins to tear apart that was never meant to be torn apart. So again, the idea, you are an integrated being. So from the very beginning, we are invited to recognize that your physical self is part of who you are. You cannot pull these things apart without doing actual damage to your whole self. Your spirit, the intangible essence of you, is completely entangled with your physicality, with your body, your flesh and your blood and your bones are a part of your spiritual self. These things cannot be disentangled without doing harm. So sometimes we don't know how to reconcile these two dimensions. Again, because maybe we were raised in a system that, ter- that, that insists that these two things are, are divided, that these two things are at odds. But again, in the scriptures, it's like, no, these two things are connected. Nishmat and Adama cannot be disentangled. And this is actually not a new conversation. This is a very old conversation. So in a, in a second, we're gonna look at a passage from the book of Ephesians. But a couple of things that we have to understand about the book of Ephesians before we look at it. One is in the original Greek, there is no division between chapter and verse. It was just one long text. This is a letter written by a guy named Paul to a group of uh, people in a church in the city called Ephesus. And this is a, a letter written in Greek to this group of people. And Paul did not stop to make chapter breaks. It was all written in one long flowing text. And what's interesting about the structure of the book of Ephesians is for the entire first half of this letter, there are no commandments. There is no instruction. There is no, now do this better for the first, like fully the first half. If you, if you look at it as it's structured now, this would be chapters one, two, and three, no commandments at all in, in those chapters. You don't get a single instruction until chapter four, which is the exact halfway point in the letter. What do you get instead? You get affirmation. You get lots and lots of language about you are loved, you are welcome, you are seen, you are accepted, you were disconnected, now you are a part of something bigger than yourself. 
So anytime someone shows you a passage in Ephesians and is like, do better, recognize, we have to recognize that that came after lots and lots and lots of language about you already are loved, accepted, welcome, seen exactly as you are. There are no corrective instructions until everybody has it like deeply embedded within their brains of, listen, before we go any further, you have to know that you are loved. And so any kind of instruction or further development is, let's try and figure out what it looks like to be the best possible versions of ourselves that we can be. How do we become more wholly integrated beings? So it isn't like, do this or else. It's like, look, you are loved. You are seen. So let's explore that. Let's explore what that looks like to become more of that. So we're going to look at Ephesians 5, but, but understand that Ephesians 5 comes after lots of language of affirmation. So in Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 1, it says this. It says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Then here in verse 3, it says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. So, okay, let's pause for just a second real quick. Before we go any further, I do want to just acknowledge, I, I fully understand that this verse and verses like it have been used for, for a long time in church culture to, bring, to, to cause people to feel lots of shame and embarrassment about themselves and about their bodies. And so maybe you grew up in a system that told you, that used language like this to shame you. Maybe you grew up in a system that today we might refer to as purity culture. And so they would use passages like this to basically convey the message to you, your body is evil, and you need to keep your body from being, like, like you need to disentangle yourself as much as you can from your physical self in order to be a better spiritual being. This is sounding familiar to anybody. Yeah. So maybe you grew up in a system that gave you that. And so as we look at this passage, I want to first acknowledge that that's a thing that possibly exists in the room. And if that is you, if you came out of a system that gave you lots of shame by using this language, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you have to carry that baggage with you. I'm sorry that that's part of sort of the mental furniture that lives inside your head now. And, and then second of all, I want to say my hope is for the next few minutes, maybe we can reclaim some of this. And maybe we can kind of look at this through a slightly different lens and begin to ask, like, is this really what, is this really what that was about? Or is, is there something bigger that Paul was actually trying to get at? Was it, is it possible that when people read this, they actually thought it was good news? So we're going we're gonna to take a look at that. So I did want to acknowledge that and get that out of the way. And I will say we're going to talk about this, uh, this kind of, these words in some detail. And so that's a bit of a trigger warning. If, if these words are like kind of um, loaded for you, and that's not something you're ready for, that's totally okay. Feel free to check out at any point. So um, I, I did want to just sort of say that right off the bat. So all that to say, we have to understand the world that this letter came out of. Now, Ephesians, like every other letter in the Bible, did not come out of a vacuum. This was written to a group of people in a real city at a real time. So what's going on in the city of Ephesus that they would be receiving this message at all? Great question. Thank you for asking. So the, Ephesus was the world headquarters for a goddess named Artemis. Also, um, Artemis also is often referred to as Diana, depending on which uh, culture you came out of. So, but in Ephesus, uh, it, the, the dominant term for this person or this goddess was, uh, uh, was Artemis. So Artemis was the goddess of fertility and sexuality. And so if you, for example, wanted to have children, one of the things that you would need to do was make sure that Artemis was on your side. So Artemis, her religion dominates the city of Ephesus. It is estimated that at least one million people per year at this time would travel to Ephesus every single year to pay homage to Artemis. In fact, we have, I think we have an artist rendering. Yeah, this is an artist rendering of the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. Um, the, the temple is actually not there anymore. It was destroyed, but archaeologists have basically determined that this is, this is pretty much uh, a good approximation of, of the size and scope of it. So it was pretty big. It, it, was a, it was a pretty big operation that they had going on. And so, um, and so in the Temple of Artemis, you would have lots of people throughout, like the entire city of Ephesus kind of revolved around in lots of ways the worship and um, serving of the goddess Artemis and this, this, um, this movement that had risen up around the go goddess Artemis. So imagine that you have spent years hoping for children, and you are being told 
that the only way that the gods will allow you to have children is to convince Artemis to take up your cause. What do you do? Well, there's some pretty, there, there, there's some ways that you would have to serve Artemis that may or may not feel a little bit dicey and uncomfortable to you. So one way would, would have been, if you, were, if you were one of these people, you would travel to the city of Ephesus, you would attend various festivals and events that we'll talk about in a second, and then, um, and then as you were leaving, you would exit through the gift shop, because that's not new, and as you were exiting through the gift shop, you would buy a couple of statues of Artemis, and you would take them to your home, and you would place them in specific spaces so that Artemis would remember that you had served her and that you wanted to have children. And so the, the hope was Artemis will bless you with children. But imagine being told that and then it not happening. What, what does that do to you? What kind of trauma does that cause? Oh, well, then, of course, if you go back to the priest, they would say, well, then you have to try harder. You have to do more. You have to, you have to try harder to serve the goddess Artemis. And so how do you serve the god, goddess Artemis? Well, that is where things get a little bit gross. So um, if you have kids in the room, I'm going to go ahead and let you know there is no G-rated way of talking about what I'm about to talk about. So um, heads up, feel free to earmuff it or send somebody out for some um, donut holes or whatever. But um, you were warned. Don't say you weren't. So anyway, so if you, were, if you were one of these people, what would you have to do? Well, one of the things that they would do is they would have something that they would refer to as the Festival of Artemis. And so what was the Festival of Artemis? Well, they would go out into a large wooded area, and you would, how to say this, you would, uh, the whole thing would basically function around everyone would kind of do whatever felt right to them as it pertained to how you your body interacts with everybody else's body who is there. And so how's that for vague? So that was um, so that was kind of how things worked. And so you would go out to these festivals and you would basically go into this area where different people who were also trying to please Artemis would basically use their bodies and use the bodies of others to, um, to show Artemis how devoted they were to her. So that would have been, so I can't imagine everybody who participated in that wanted to participate in that, but they were told, well, if you don't, then Artemis might not bless you. And so there were probably people who had gone out and done this and had really sacrificed their own like comfort and dignity as a way of trying to get Artemis to bless them. So imagine you've come out of that. Imagine you've come out of a system that tells you that a person's body is for your consumption and that your body is for other people's consumption. What does that do to your soul? What does that do to your nishmat? And so it is safe to assume that lots of people in Paul's audience, as Paul is writing this letter to the book of, to the Ephesians, it's safe to assume that lots of people in Paul's audience are in the process of emerging out of this very specific religious tradition. And so when we read the book of Ephesians, we need to keep one eye on what people might have been feeling as they emerge from this very specific brand of spiritual trauma. And so it's possible that people have been allowing their bodies to be used in ways that they were not comfortable with and that they did not enjoy and that they were harmful to them in lots and lots of ways because they were told this is how the gods bless you. So all of a sudden, Paul's writing this letter, and he's saying, you don't have to live this way. To us, to a Western American ear, without context, Ephesians 5 sounds just like puritanical, like, finger-wagging. But to the people in Ephesus, this is like, oh, wait, we, we don't have to, we don't have to live like this anymore? Like, there, there's a way of being that doesn't require the, like, the complete... Um, objectification of ourselves and the people around us. So anyway, so let's dig into some of the language that Paul uses here. In, in Ephesians 5, let's go back to verse 3. He says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Let's take a look at each of these words. So first of all, the word sexual immorality. Um, the word sexual immorality literally is the word, in Greek, is the word porneo. And that is what it sounds like, but also, but originally, the, the term was not a sexualized term at first. Originally, this word was an economic term. It literally means to pass through. And so what, what it is, because Ephesus, this is a very specific word in the city of Ephesus, because in Eph Ephesus was a gateway from the east to the west in terms of trade. And so if you were somebody who made and manufactured things in the eastern part 
half of what was the known world at the time, you might like fabrics or spices or whatever, you would travel to Ephesus and you would stop in, in this marketplace called the Agora and you would sell your wares in the Agora and the people who bought them would then take them and move them into the western part of the known world. And so, this, so the idea is things are passing through the Agora every day. There is an economic transaction going on. And so this word, porneo, what, what, is, what has become known as sexual immorality was originally language about when something goes from one place to another and it's just an economic transaction. It's just we're taking this thing or moving it to this place and all it is, it's, it, is a, it is a means of, ma like it's, it's basically, um, it's about convenience, it's about economics, it's about making money. And so this is, what, what is Paul talking about here? When it's con contextualized in, a, in, in, in terms of sexual immorality, what is Paul talking about? Oh, he's talking about what happens when somebody's body becomes a product. What happens when a person's Adama becomes a thing that can be just bought and sold and used at other people's convenience? Okay, yeah, this is actually a very dark way of seeing other people. Then the next word he uses is impurity. So impurity here in Greek is the word akathartos. Akathartos literally means polluted. So this is when something with inherent goodness becomes devalued. Something that has some sort of value or goodness becomes less valuable because of how we treat it. Again, we're talking about how we treat and talk about other people's bodies. When something that is sacred and holy becomes just another thing that I can use, becomes a com commodity that can be used and tossed aside, well, that's akathartos, that's impurity, that's, that, that is de the devaluation of something that has inherent value. This is how we talk about and treat other people's bodies. Then um, he uses the word greed which doesn't seem to sort of connect to the other two things, but it kind of does. And in Greek, this is the word pleonexia. And literally means, it literally means to have more or to want to have more. And this is basically a way of saying, when we become slaves to our most base instincts, when we receive something, when we consume something, and our first impulse is to want more of that thing, that is pleonexia. That is the, like, the complete, like this is our animal urge saying, whatever I have, I want more of that thing. And so this is what happens when I see other people as a way of just getting more of the thing that I want. Oh, okay. So all of a sudden, this is not just like, hey, when you're at youth camp, don't make out with your girlfriend, right? Like this is, some of you went to false creek, I can tell. Um, <laughs> that one hit close to home. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very small way of talking about this. No, this is about like when another person's body, when another person's Adama becomes just a thing that I can treat however I want to treat it. This has to do with the dehumanization of other people. This is about what happens when other people's bodies become products. This is about what happens when my body becomes just a thing that I trade in. Oh, oh, all of a sudden, a thing that was meant to have some sort of sacred value to it has become devalued. Okay, so this is what happens when the, the spirit and the dust become disentangled. The Adama and the Nishmat are no longer connected to each other. Okay, this is what Paul is getting at. So then let's look at verse 4. It says, um, right, right on the heels of that, it says, Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So what are these words? So obscenity, just real quickly, the word obscenity here literally means anything that causes shame. Anything that I do or say that causes another person to feel shame, Paul is saying, yeah, that's never going to help. That's never, that, that will never be something that brings more life and goodness to the world. Anytime I intentionally walk into the room and cause another person to feel shame, there is something very dark about that. I am, I'm doing harm to both the spirit and the nishma, or and the dust, the, the adama and the nishmat. So then he, he says foolish talk. Foolish talk is the word morose, and it literally means to elevate the self at the expense of others. Have you ever, and, uh, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody, and somebody says something to you along the lines of, like, look at what you're wearing. You're so brave. Like, is that a compliment? Or is that a dig? Like, what in the world? Like, did you really just say that? So, and there, there is this passive-aggressive way that people talk to each other and deal with, you, with each other and comment on each other as a way of saying, like, you're just, it, you, you know, it's just not working for you. Or, or having, like, be, basically being, like, very subtly, very passive-aggressively critical, specifically about another person's appearance, but just any sort of way that I will say something that will sort of put me in a place of just a little bit higher. I will feel a little bit better because I brought you a little bit lower. 
And what Paul is saying is, yeah, that's foolish talk. That is morose. That is, that is a thing that we don't want to participate in. What that does is that devalues the self. And Paul is saying, what are we doing? Like, when we, you don't have to live like that. And then the next thing he says is coarse joking. And this is the word eutropalia. And this literally means easily turned. It's when you're having a conversation and everything that we're, anytime we're talking about something good and, and beautiful and life-giving becomes sort of like some, something that becomes small and um, degrading in some sort of way. This is, this, is, this is a way of taking something that should be talked about with some sort of like goodness and beauty and we just make it something that is dark. I, uh, I used to work at a church, and uh, the I, I was not the senior pastor. I was um, I was just on staff there, and um, but I was I was sitting in a service one time, and and the lead pastor was doing a sermon, and his opening illustration of like for his sermon, like for the first five ten minutes of the whole sermon, was him telling a story about how he had gone to his twenty year high school reunion and he ran into his ex girlfriend, and he he spent a long time talking about how unattractive his ex-girlfriend had, had gotten and how glad he was that he didn't end up with her. And so he starts making lots of jokes about her appearance and lots of very insulting, very degrading things about this person. And I'm just sitting in the back just being embarrassed that I even worked at this church at all. And so after, after the service was over, I went over to him because I couldn't say nothing. And so I, I went over to him and I was like, hey, man, I'm not sure that story was the best way to go there. And, and he said, what? I was just joking. Like, okay, but what, like, the nature of your joking was harmful to another person. Like, if, imagine what would happen if that woman listens to this podcast. How, like, what would that do to her? Like, how, how would that affect her soul? Like, no consideration at all for that. And so all of this language that Paul is talking about here, what, and so oh, anyway, so what, what was this pastor doing? Oh, the pastor, in telling that story, was robbing this woman of her nishmat. He was, he was degrading her in a way that reduces not only her physical self, but also her spirit. It, it, is, it is a thing that just dehumanizes her in all sorts of ways. And what Paul is getting at with all of this language is he's not saying, you know, like, he's not trying to introduce, like, puritanical, like, very, like, strict, uptight ways of living your life. What he's saying is we don't have to live in a way that devalues and degrades other people. There is a better way of living. And again, if you'd come out of the cult of Artemis, you'd have been like, this is, this is revolutionary. Like, you, you're telling me we don't? We, we don't have to live like this? We can, there's a better way of being in the world? So Paul is in no way shaming people for having physical bodies. He's not saying, like, you need to be ashamed of your body. You need to be careful with your body. You need to always um, apologize for your body. Like, no, Paul is not at all interested in that kind of conversation. Paul is saying when we treat other people as if their value comes from how we see them, something deeply broken has happened. Paul is saying to people, again, who have recently left this cult of Artemis, Paul is saying, you have been told that your value comes from how other people have been allowed to talk about and use your bodies. But I am telling you that you are so much more than that, that your body and your soul are connected, that your Adama and your Nishmat are all part of who you are. The people in Ephesus had inherited a system in which the Adama and the Nishmat had been ripped apart from each other. And Paul is trying to reintegrate how people see their physical selves and their spiritual selves. So then in verse 5, he says this, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And again, this word inheritance, this is another one that we kind of have to re rethink and, and reevaluate how we talk about. Inheritance is not like, well, when you die, you get to go to the good place and not the bad place. That's not what Paul's doing. Paul is saying inheritance for Paul is talking about, you, is talking about partnership and participation. Paul is saying, for the pe people who in this world who spend all of their time degrading and treating other people's bodies as products are not participating in the story that God is telling. There is a much larger, more beautiful story, and you are a part of it. You are better than this, is what Paul is trying to say. So then in verse 6, 
He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you, want, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. And again, he's talking about like how we talk about and treat other people's bodies. And then in verse 13, he says, but every Everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So he talks about light a lot here. And he says, you used to live this way. You used to be a part of this Artemis movement where people are objects and products for your consumption. And you used to be a part of a system in which it's okay to dehumanize other people. But now you are part of a new way of being. And the story that Jesus is inviting you to is something bigger. It's a story filled with light. And light here is not described as a list of philosophical agreements that we all have, have said, like, yes, we all agree with these things. We all believe these things. That's, it, it's not like, well, we have to affirm, like, these five, like, theological ideas, and that's what light looks like. No, for Paul, it's, um, it's described in very flesh and blood terms. It's, it's connected to how we treat our bodies and the bodies of other people. Light is how we see ourselves and one another. Light is, oh, the, the Adama and the Nishmat are reconnected. We are reintegrated beings. So a couple of quick observations on this. One, your physical self, your physical humanity is a good thing. Again, maybe you were raised with a story of your physical self is bad and your, and your spiritual self is good. And I think the scriptures all throughout continue to say, like, that's not really how things were set up to be. Like, the whole thing, it's all spiritual. Your physical self is your spiritual self. There is no disconnection between the two. Your physical humanity is a good thing. What you eat, how much you sleep, your daily habits, these are spiritual questions. These are spiritual, in, like, practices and ways of engaging the spiritual world. Everything is spiritual. And by the way, so is the physical humanity of others. When you are interacting with another person, you are, you are interacting with someone who is both Adama and Nishma. You are interacting with someone whose physical self is their spiritual self. So that's the first thing. Your physical humanity is a good thing. The second thing is this. Some things are beneath you. Some, which is to say there are certain ways of thinking and talking about and engaging that are actually dehumanizing, that make us less connected to the Adama and the Nishmat. Um, stories and jokes that degrade other people's appearances, like, like I talked about before. If you grew up in a system that we would maybe refer to as toxic masculinity, in which um, the, way, the way we treat people of different genders is very kind of skewed and outdated and pretty harmful, um, yeah, that's beneath you. Because what that does is it robs us of the nishmat. It, it degrades us and it makes us just like a stereotype of whatever, um, of whatever people see us as. And so, like, yeah, Paul is saying, like, no, that's, that's beneath you. you. You're better than that. You are, a, you are a fully integrated being, and that kind of thing is beneath you. Um, locker room talk is beneath you. The way we talk about other people in ways that degrade others to make ourselves feel a little bit better. Passive-aggressive remarks about somebody else's appearance. Yeah, that's beneath you. You don't have to live like that. It robs you of your nishmat, and it robs the other person of theirs as well. And then the third thing is your skin and your soul are connected. You, from the beginning, have always been an integrated being. You are fully connected. You are invited to be a fully integrated, fully whole connected being. Your Adama and your Nishmat are all part of the same story. That's what makes you who you are. So if you grew up in a religious system, maybe you were taught that your physical self was inherently bad or at least unimportant, and your physicality, your sexuality, your health, your well-being, you, ne you were never told these are spiritual issues, but they are. So may you reclaim these things. May you reconnect yourself to both the Adama and the Nishma. May you see that the physical self is the spiritual self. So maybe you've been handed a, a point of view that suggests that you are only just a bag of flesh and not much more than that. May you reclaim that as well. May you say, like, no, there's more to me 
than just that. I'm not just like random neurons firing and like skin and bones and blood. I'm more, I am Adama, I am Nishmat, and so are the other people around me. Your physical self is your spiritual self. It's all connected. You cannot disengage one from the other without doing harm. You are an integrated being. So may you find that you are part of the story in which we are becoming reintegrated. May you find that your Adama and your Nishmat are all part of the same story. May you reclaim your physical self as part of your spiritual self. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for this invitation to reintegrate and reevaluate how we see ourselves. And for those of us who were raised in, in systems and with messages telling us that our bodies were something that we needed to be afraid of, ashamed of, disconnected from, May we heal from those wounds. May we reclaim the reality that you say, no, it's all part of the same good story. It's all Adama and Nishmat. We're all, the whole thing is connected. May we reclaim that story. May we find that we are becoming more integrated and more whole as we move through this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.